Justice is one of the most profound concepts ever devised by mankind. And I would submit to you that each of us, if given the opportunity right here, right now, to write out your definition of justice, you could do so. But you might find that your definition of what justice is would be different, maybe sometimes substantially from your friend or your neighbor or your colleague. But I believe that what you would say if I, well, let, let me just try a test here. I'm going to say a couple of words and see what your reaction is. Holocaust, Spanish Inquisition, ISIS, lynching, slavery, trail of tears. I suspect that your reaction is that, of course, is not justice. It's the antithesis. It's the opposite. It is injustice. And that is what we as humanity have been struggling about since the beginning of time. As a matter of fact, I would submit to you that justice is part of our human DNA. If we go back to the Old Testament, if we go back to the book of Deuteronomy, it said, justice, justice, you shall pursue. And this was just the first of many, many discussions about what justice is. And then we go up to 1787 in the Constitution. And what do we know about justice there? It says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, shall establish justice. And that is the first thing they talk about in that preamble because it was so critical to creating a more perfect union. So what I think that we probably react to is, well, that sounds like justice, but we know that the people who wrote that, did they really believe in justice? Because in that very same document, they said, slavery is okay. We can continue slavery for another 20 years. That black men and black women should be considered as less than a whole person. They are less than their white counterparts. And some of the same people who framed this document also were involved in the Declaration of Independence where they said all men are created equal. But yet we know, looking back, that that's not what they meant. They certainly didn't mean all men. And it had to be men who looked just like them and had the same amount of property and things like that. It didn't include women or anybody who was a minority. So over time, the concept of justice has evolved. And you might sit here and say, gee, we're pretty good here. We don't think that way anymore. But ask yourself before you get too smug, what's the next generation or two going to say about this world and how we're leaving it? Look at the violence in the United States. Look at the poverty in the United States. Look at the intolerance in the United States. Is that justice? I think that the answer is pretty clear. We haven't arrived, so we're going through an evolution. So let me just digress a little bit and say, what about the institutions that have been set up to help bring justice to our society? What about those agencies of, uh, of, of government? Well, it happens to be, and coincidentally, I am here because I'm a member of the United States Department of Justice. And it's the only federal department that has justice in its name. And I will tell you that I have been a member of that department, despite my incredibly young look, for 34 years. And I know that's shocking. And I will tell you that when I started in 1982 in, just, in the Department of Justice in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, my job was what you see on TV. We got cases, we saw people who committed crimes, we charged them, we went to trial, we, upon conviction, we, uh, we argued the case before a judge or a jury, then we took the case to sentencing upon conviction. And why? Because justice, as perceived by the United States Justice Department, that had been in effect since really 1789, um, that that responsibility was always law enforcement. We didn't see really there were many options to law enforcement. 
We had to make sure that we arrested all the bad guys, the bad guys, whatever that means. But something changed in 2009, 2010. There was this growing realization that we can't arrest our way out of the problem. That while we're really good at it, we're really good at prosecuting people, and I get to work with great agents from the FBI, DEA, ATF, Homeland Security, we're still not solving the problem. So we have to get to some of the underlying issues. Well, let's look at what some of those are. Look at these statistics, they're sickening. 14,196 people were murdered in the United States in 2013. I'm not talking about suicides, which gets us to over 30,000. And of those people, 8,583 were killed with a gun, about two out of every three people who's murdered in the United States is killed with a firearm. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that this was three years ago, it hasn't gotten a lot better. As a matter of fact, it's starting to get worse again. So what does that say? Well, we, as good as we've been, and I think we've been really good because the numbers of people murdered in the United States has come down almost 50% since 1989, 1990. We have a long way to go. And just arresting people is not enough. What about Philadelphia, though? Maybe it's better here. You know, we're 15 minutes from there. From this map, you can see that we're, Philadelphia is a city of neighborhoods. It's called the city of brotherly love. Isn't that great? Well, this is Philadelphia. This is another look at Philadelphia. And maybe you've never seen a map like this. I see them all the time. From 2001 through 2015, 4,728 people were murdered in the streets and in the homes in Philadelphia. Each dark spot there is, represents a real human being whose life was lost to violence. But this is even a more troubling map because during that same period of time, 22,053 people were shot. And when I say shot, I mean a bullet from a firearm went into another human being in Philadelphia and the dark spots are the people who were murdered, and the other spots are people who wear the scar forever of that assault. And they wear the badge of also the emotional impact that that had on them as well. Now take a look at, if you look at this, some of these, the thickness of some of this. You could drill down and you'd find out in these same communities, there's shooting and homicide and shooting and homicide and this is where people are living. Here we are just 15, 20 minutes away from some of these communities in the peace and security and safety of Upper Dublin in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. We don't worry about this. So what can we do? What can we in the Department of Justice do? After all, I have been in the department for 34 years. My title is assistant U.S. attorney. Actually, I'm the executive assistant U.S. attorney. And I will tell you that it's a fancy name because I'm a federal prosecutor. And that means that we put people in jail. And I gotta tell you, you might not like this, but I've been responsible for putting lots of people in jail. I think some people deserve it. Actually, I think a lot of people deserve it when they harm other human being, beings and they take their lives and harm them in fundamental ways. But we've decided that we have to do more. We have to reach out to the community. We have to be proactive in finding solutions to stop crime before it happens. So let me just talk to you about some of the underlying causes. The Philadelphia Inquirer had this chart that was just in the paper on the front page just a few weeks ago. And it says that if you're living in Upper Dublin, you're probably pretty safe and your life expectancy is pretty long. But if you're in North Philadelphia, in this zip code, 19132, where Strawberry Mansion is, your life expectancy is 68 years. If you live down on the eastern part of the center city, 19106, your life expectancy is 88 years. It's a distance of four miles. It's a 20-year difference in life. You know, there's a saying in Philadelphia, alive till 25. That's a mantra that young people sometimes say in Philadelphia because they don't believe they're gonna make it. How sick is that? 
So what can we do in the justice system to make it better? Well, we first of all have to look, know that this is the reality and why are people living for such short periods of time relative to other people? Well, there's all of these issues that go on in Philadelphia and some of these communities that may not impact this community that, where we are right now. You may or may not know this, but the heroin uh, problem and the addiction problem in Philadelphia is completely out of control, never been worse. But also, in addition to that, poverty in that 191332 area code, or zip code, excuse me, is 100%. 100% of the people living in that community live below the poverty line. And joblessness? You know, we hear, oh well, we added 130,000 jobs last month. Those jobs don't go to North Philadelphia. They don't have a 5% unemployment rate. They have 50, 60, 70% unemployment. All of the things you've heard today about choices and opportunities, that is not the reality of what goes on in certain areas of Philadelphia and other parts of the, of the United States. So what can we do? What we can do is we reach out and work with the community. Now I will tell you that in 2012, I was asked and my office was asked by Mayor Nutter, he was then the Philadelphia mayor, to go to Strawberry Mansion High School because they were struggling. They had been the only uh, high school on the persistently dangerous list for years. And they, they knew we were doing programs in school, so they asked us to come to that school. And we did. And one of the first things I did was I met with the principal. Her name is Linda Clyatt Wayman. And I will tell you, she's an extraordinary woman, and she's done a TED Talk. You gotta go watch it. I asked her, what can we do? Understanding, I'm a federal prosecutor. I'll do what I can. We're good at bringing people together, but tell me what we can do. She said, we need a football team. A football team? Strawberry Mansion has been around for a long time. In fact, it had been around 47 years in 2012. Never had a football team. We got, them, we got them a football team for the first time in 47 years. We worked with the school district. We got them the uniforms. We got them the practice fields. And we got them a field. First time. This was after the first year. They went undefeated. For these kids, this was an opportunity to play football in an organized league and actually experience success. People from the community could look together and say with pride, look at what we have accomplished. But you know, this almost didn't happen because I got a call from Ms. Wayman three weeks before the season started and she said, none of my kids have had physicals because they didn't have doctors. So fortunately, we were able to call and get doctors from CHOP and St. Chris's to come to the high school to give the students physicals. And I will tell you, my wife who was here, she and I on other occasions had gone to the school to give kids at Strawberry Mansion High School physicals. We started something else called the Strawberry Mansion High School Youth Court. And that's something that probably doesn't exist in Upper Dublin High School. But I will tell you that in Philadelphia, there was a no tolerance policy for a long time. And what that meant was you screw up in any way, you're gone. You're suspended for some period of time. And that's what they were doing. They were not gonna have tolerance. Well, we tried to bring in a slightly different arrangement. We said, what if we have students be judge and jury of other students in a courtroom setting? And they devised the restorative way to mete out justice for their fellow students. Well, you know, when this group first got together in the beginning of 2012, one of the students said to me, I gotta tell you, I think all prosecutors and judges should burn in hell. Successfully, I have not burned yet. But I will tell you that four years later, because of the success of this youth court, 88 kids, 88 students went to that youth court and 88 students received sentences, restorative sentences from their fellow students that did not include suspension. So none of those 88 people was suspended, left school, and so they could not be part of what we now call the school to prison pipeline. We started a program, it's called Voices of Youth. And I, I will tell you that one of the, again, the things that we in the U.S. Attorney's Office can do is we bring back, look, 
you never want to have someone call you up from the U.S. Attorney's Office. Let me just be very clear. Because most people associate that with getting a grand jury subpoena and something bad. But in this situation, we are able to bring people to the table who are all of like mind to say, how can we make a difference? So we got educators and we got police and we got people from the medical profession to say, what can we do for these kids? They said, let's come up with a program where the kids can actually be heard. We can actually listen to these kids. They can devise programs themselves in their own voices, much like we've heard about today. And what we did was we did it through film. And the exciting thing here was they created a film called Morning at Night, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. The theme was a horribly gone wrong dispute, beef on a basketball court, left to, uh, resulted in death. And so as a result of that, excuse me, as a result of that, they created this film, Morning at Night, and these kids won Best Narrative Documentary and they received an award at the Kimmel Center. Now for kids from Strawberry Mansion to travel that four mile stretch, to be acknowledged by their peers and people in the film community for doing something great was totally out of the box stuff. This is another group of Strawberry Mansion students. These were sophomores last year, they're now juniors. We started a program called the Philadelphia Project, where we worked with a filmmaker from Canada, actually, for seven months to, to teach them about leadership and get them again to, this was a further, this was kind of the advanced course of the Voices of Youth. Anyway, make a long story short, seven months later, you could see that these, pe these young people had been transformed through the creative process of working with a, a talented filmmaker, with a teacher, and as a result, these kids are proving that you can be from Strawberry Mansion High School, from Upper Dublin, if you're given the opportunity, if you've got the desire, you can achieve greatness no matter where you are. And this, we have a film, an hour film that's gonna be coming out soon, talking about the transformation of these kids. Then we started a community garden, working with the East Park Revitalization Authority we took a three-acre uh, tract of land right across from the school that was completely vacant, and we've now built 90 raised beds. Now, if you went there right now, they're all blooming. There's 90 of them. Um, there's 24 of these beds are for the, for the kids from the high school who, because they've started a culinary arts program. These kids are learning how to grow food and harvest it and make it, make the food, and then serve it. And here you see some of the students with Ms. Wayman, um, who is right there, with these are the Eagles, some of the Philadelphia Eagles, who are there visiting the school, helping to plant some additional trees. Again, an opportunity to actually have a growth in this community. And you wanna know in the fall, they're going to have the first greenhouse in North Philadelphia on that location. And then we brought something that is really out of the box. Again, remember I'm a federal prosecutor. I'm, I'm not a scientist, uh, Mr. Traley. I am just a lawyer. But I've had the opportunity to meet with some of the foremost doctors, psychiatrists, mental health people who are in Philadelphia from all of the hospitals who are experts in the area of trauma. And what they've taught me is that when you are experiencing violence, like the kids in North Philadelphia, remember those maps, you will suffer relentless stress to the point of PTSD. And your brain changes. The development of your brain is different if you live in North Philadelphia than it is if you live in Upper Dublin. Is that just? I say no. But we are working with the community. We've started a program called SMASH, Strawberry Mansion, a Sanctuary for Hope, to work with the community so that they can understand trauma and find ways to heal it. And it's been a year and a half effort, and we're still going. And we're working with the police, the police in the 22nd Police District, the police that serve this group, we're finding that they too are suffering from extraordinary stress. And you hear these terrible things where they talk about communities and police not getting along and these terrible police incidents. Well, I suspect part of that is because police are suffering too. 
So we're reaching out in a new way to figure out how can we bring the police and the community together in a more effective way. And fortunately, in 2012, as a result of the, the collaboration between Ms. Wayman and myself and our office, we were able to persuade the Philadelphia School District not to close Strawberry Mansion. And so they were going to close it. They announced it in December of 2012. By February, they reversed their decision. And that was a great collaboration, and we still work here. And another thing, since that, and really through the work of Ms. Wayman and her staff, but also as a result of the efforts we've made, Strawberry Mansion is no longer part of this most persistently dangerous school list. They're off it, and they've been off since 2013. So I just a few other real quick things. We brought the Pennsylvania Ballet to an elementary school in North Philadelphia. 36 first graders learned the art of ballet, and they've been to the Academy of Music to see the Nutcracker. And again, an out-of-the-box experience for these people. As agile and as much as, for those of you who know Baryshnikov, I know you look at me, I can't dance a step, but these kids are learning and they're getting this opportunity to see the world in a different way. We have Big Brothers Big Sisters program, which we bring 30 children to our school and they're mentored by federal prosecutors and, for, and our staff. And their bigs are people from the U.S. Attorney's Office. Again, a whole new experience. We created a program for kids in the juvenile justice system where rather than sitting home on house arrest, we are giving them the opportunity through the Philadelphia Youth Sports Collaborative to learn sport and to be mentored in sport. So kids from North Philadelphia are learning about golf and tennis and fishing as well as basketball and football. And 400 kids have been through this program and it's through our office that this happened. I want to just finish with saying one thing. Justice is this profound word that I talked about earlier and that we all know about. But justice takes forms of not only through uh, prevention, but also through what we call prisoner reentry. In 2010, I met a remarkable man named Al Sawyer. He had spent eight years, beginning at the age of 17. He had spent the time in jail because he shot another drug dealer. You would write him off and say, at the age of 17, this kid has no future. He learned in Graterford Prison, the largest maximum security prison in, in, in Pennsylvania, something about video. And he got out and he really learned about video and he wanted to give back and he came to me and we met. And I didn't know he was an ex-offender. He said his dream was to make a film, a film about the challenges of re-entering so he could help other people returning from prison. And we created this film, Pull of Gravity, which we've now shown all over the United States. And it's a remarkable film about the lives of three people who've made that difficult journey. El Sawyer is a very close friend of mine. This is El Sawyer standing next to the President of the United States. I was very happy when the White House called last summer and they said the President was coming, wanted to do something on reentry. Could we introduce him, to the President, to somebody? And I had the President meet with El Sawyer and this young man, Robert Warner, who I prosecuted in 1990. We helped get him a job with Philadelphia Cease Fire. So there is justice, it just looks a lot different. So what is justice? Justice is a process, and we're not there yet. We're learning every day. I'm 61 years old, 34 years in the Department of Justice. I am learning more now than I've ever learned but it is a great experience to participate in this evolution where we realize that justice means more than treating people fairly and equally. It means treating people with dignity and with respect and with empathy. Thank you.